Yes. Now I think he, he is in New York. Yeah, yeah, he told he, me. Yeah. In fact, I contacted him. I did not know. I did not know that his uh, term had expired. And in fact, uh, uh, he connected uh, me to you. So when I wrote to him, uh, then he advised me to, uh, you know, contact you. And I think uh, he had sent a mail to you also. Yes. Yes. लोडशिप तो है इसमें आई एम जस्ट लुकिंग फॉर वेटिंग फॉर डॉक्टर अनिरुद्ध राजपूत कॉल करता हूं सर हाँ सर प्रणाम सर हाँ सर आ गए सर आप ओके सर ओके थैंक यू सर थैंक यू सर आ गए हैं सर अच्छा कैन यू सी मी या सर नमस्कार सर नमस्कार गुड आफ्टरनून लॉर्डशिप गुड आफ्टरनून गुड आफ्टरनून डॉक्टर आहुजा सो वी हैड ऑलरेडी सीन योर आवर नेम इन द लिस्ट बट देन वी वर जस्ट लुकिंग व्हदर द सर हैड जॉइंड और लाइक इट इज द ऑफिस यू नो व्हिच हैड कनेक्टेड एक्चुअली हां जी दे हैव कनेक्टेड इन फैक्ट दे वर जस्ट वेटिंग ओके Yeah, we are waiting for uh, just a minute. Please take your time. Please take your time. Hello. Ah, uh, I, I email, I email, I send, 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 डॉक्टर मिश्रा वो मेरे ख्याल से ये लिंक आपने नया वाला नहीं भेजा क्या उनको राजपूत साहब को नहीं सर वो सेम लिंक है सर गया हुआ है सर अभी गया हुआ है सर दोबारा आप भी सर एक बार भेज दीजिए क्योंकि वो भेज रहा उनको वो प्रॉब्लम हो रही है ज्वाइन करने में चला गया देख लिया उन्होंने Yeah, Excellency uh, Dr. Anirudh uh, Rajput has also joined. Welcome, you sir. Sir, Namaskar, sir. Dr. Rajput, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you very clearly. Hello, hello to everyone. Hello, pleasure to hello, see you sir. all. Hello, sir. Hello. Sir, Lordship, can we start now? Please, please, sir. <laughs> Mr. Dhananjay. Yes, sir. Yeah, please start. A very warm greeting to our esteemed and learned panelists, faculty members, and participants who have joined us. I, Dhananjay Ashri, welcome you all to the eighth session of the third international conference on mediation, organized by Faculty of Law, University of Delhi, and Delhi School of Public Policy and Governance, Institution of Eminence, University of Delhi, in association with Mediation and Conciliation Project Committee, Supreme Court of India. The topic of the session is. cross border dispute and international mediation in international perspective to discuss various aspects of it we have a stellar list of distinguished speakers with each of them been an expert in their own domains 
I humbly invite Honorable Mr. Justice Ajay Bhenoth, Judge, Allahabad High Court, as our esteemed chair, His Excellency Dr. Kamalain P. Bipponadol, Secretary General, Asian African Legal Consultative Organization, New Delhi, being the respected co chair, and our guest of honor, Dr. Anirud Rajput, member, United Nations International Law Commission, and an admirable special guest, Sri A.J. Jawad, mediator, partner, and head of ADR services, KD Lex Chamber. Professor Dr. V.K. Hauja, Honorable Vice Chancellor, NLUJA, Assam, and Joint Director, Delhi School of Public Policy and Governance, Institution of Eminence, University of Delhi. Before we proceed with the session, I request to all the participants to fill the feedback form available in the chat box. Kindly note that filling the feedback form is a mandatory requirement for certificates. Without any further ado, let me invite Professor Dr. V.K. Hauja. Sir is the Vice Chancellor of National Law University and Judicial Academy, Assam and Joint Director at Delhi School of Public Policy and Governance, Institution of Eminence University. An academician par excellence, Professor Dr. V.K. Hauja earned his Master's in Law from University of Delhi and Master's of Philosophy from Jawaharlal Nehru University. Having completed his PhD from University of Delhi, he has published over 50 articles in acclaimed national and international journals and scores of book chapters in the field of intellectual property laws and international law. Sir, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dhananjay. <clears throat> Honorable Mr. Justice Ajay Bhenod, Judge, Ilabad High Court, His Excellency Dr. Kamaldeen Pinit Puvadol, uh, Secretary General of uh, Asian African Legal Consultative Organization, His Excellency Dr. Anirudh Rajput, Member, United Nations International Law Commission, Shri A.J. Jawad, mediator, partner, and head of ADR services, KD Lex Chambers, and dear participants, a very good afternoon. The theme for discussion is cross-border dispute and international mediation in present international perspective. Well, friends, mediation has proved to be an effective, less time-consuming, friendly, and convenient mode to resolve all types of disputes be it political dispute, boundary dispute, or commercial dispute, or dispute uh, of any other nature which takes place between the two nations. In India, we see examples of mediation by Lord Rama when he mediated between Sugriv and Bali, mediation by Angada when he mediated between Rama and Ravana, mediation by Lord Krishna, Lord Krishna who is known as uh, the Lord of Universe, between Korva and Panva, and these examples can be found in our epics Ramayana and Mahabharata. These mediation happened several centuries back, so the credibility of uh, mediation as a mode of dispute uh, of resolving dispute is very well settled. All major wars between two nations and with some sort of mediation, and if you just look at the UN Charter, you'll find a reference to mediation in the UN Charter as well as in the United Nations Convention on Law of the Sea, apart from other international instruments. For commercial disputes, we recently have uh, the Singapore Convention on Mediation. To have a discussion on the theme, we have esteemed panelists for the session on behalf of uh, Faculty of Law, University of Delhi, Delhi School of Public Policy and Governance, University of Delhi, and MCPC Supreme Court of India. I welcome the chair of the session, Honorable Mr. Justice Ajay Banoth, Judge, Hilabad High Court. I also welcome co-chair of the session, His Excellency Dr. Kamalin Pinit Puvadol, uh, Secretary General of ALCO, who had uh, recently joined uh, uh, ALCO, uh, which is based in Delhi. I also welcome uh, my friend and guest of honor, His Excellency Dr. Anirudh Rajput, member of the UN International Law Commission. Finally, I uh, welcome our special guest, Chiri A.J. Jawad, uh, mediator, partner and head of ADR services, KD Lex Chambers, who has always been very kind to us and uh, participate in all our programs whenever we approach it. With these words, I welcome you all. Over to you, Dhananjay. Thank you so much, sir, for taking out your time and joining us today. I would now like to request Sri A.J. Jawad to address the virtual gathering. 
Sir has been a mediator since 2010 <coughs> and a passionate promoter of mediation in India from its earliest days. He works as a mediator and trainer with the Mediation and Conciliation Project Committee of the Supreme Court of India and as a global faculty with ADR ODR International UK. He is a semi-accredited mediator and has recently joined KD Lex Chamber as a partner and head of ADR services. Sir, the virtual floor is yours. Sorry, I was muted. Thank you, Dr. Dananjay, Dr. Professor Ahuja, uh, Honorable Chair, Mr. Justice Ajay Bahnot, Judge Allahabad High Court, esteemed co-chair, His Excellency, Dr. Kamalin, guest of honor, Dr. Anirudh Rajput, the moderator of this section, uh, Dr. VK Ahuja, uh, the prime mover and shaker of this conference, my dear friend, Dr. Ashutosh Mishra, and uh, friends, colleagues, and students who are attending the session today. I'm thankful to the Faculty of Law, Delhi School of Public Policy and Governance, Institution of Eminence, and the Honorable Mediation and Conciliation Project Committee, Supreme Court of India, for giving me this opportunity to speak at this August gathering. Uh, being the first speaker and having more eminent speakers coming in after me, I want to utilize the time uh, provided to me to discuss cross-border mediation from the international perspective without going into the Indian context. I'm sure that my esteemed co-panelists will uh, take us deeper into the subject. Well, as we all know today, information technology, social media, and artificial intelligence have changed the way we live and do business. Territorial borders have lost meaning. Uh, the industrial trade and consumer markets have become global, targeting new markets across borders and consumers exploring new products and services that are exclusive, affordable, or unique. I think multinational companies have never had it so good before as they have now. Now, one of the results of this trend is that commercial disputes have taken on new dimensions, which include foreign counterparties and multinational entities. Uh, while researching for this session, I came across a very interesting paper by Thomas uh, Gaultier. I hope I have pronounced the name correctly, which is titled Cross-Border Mediation, a New Solution for International Commercial Disputes and Settlement. Gaultier points out, I'm quoting, in dealing with the evolution of commercial conflicts, parties have increasingly found the national court systems inadequate for various reasons, ranging from cost, delay, inability to handle the technicalities of international disputes and lack of qualification of national judges. Therefore, the actors of the global commercial scene have turned to alternative means to solve their disputes. Quotation closed. Now, for a considerable length of time, arbitration ruled the roost as it offered some advantages such as confidentiality, uh, flexibility, uh, choice of venue, uh, choice of forum that were lacking in litigation. However, arbitration also has some serious drawbacks, increasing costs, delays, lack of finality, and so on. Now, some commercial, uh, international commercial entities have been recently turning to another process of alternative dispute resolution, namely mediation. Now, the evolution of the global market and the demand for an even quicker, less expensive, and less adversarial uh, dispute resolution process is leading to a new use of mediation, which was hitherto being used for domestic uh, dispute resolution, uh, namely connection with cross-border commercial disputes. Now, recognizing the benefits of mediation and cross-border disputes, the European Union adopted Directive 2008-52 by EC on the 21st of May 2008. Now, the directive focuses on five aspects of mediation. One, the quality of mediations, two, court encouragement of mediation, three, enforceability of mediation agreements, four, confidentiality of mediations, and five, the effect of mediation upon uh, limitation periods. Uh, that is the time limit within which uh, legal proceedings must be commenced. The directive seeks to address these issues in disputes between parties based in member states, cross-border disputes. The definition of a cross-border dispute is uh, subject to some exceptions, a dispute where at least one party is domiciled in a member state. Now, member states were required to <clears throat> bring into force laws necessary to comply with the directive by 21st May 2011. 
What is interesting is there is also the online dispute resolution, ODR regulation, which led to the establishment of an online platform, a free website, which is available in all the languages of the EU, by which traders and consumers in member states can attempt to settle disputes relating to online sales or service contracts. All traders within the EU, which engage in online sales, service contracts, and online marketplaces are required to provide a link on their website to this ODR platform. Now, in the paper that I referred before, Thomas Golpier points out that in order to evaluate the effectiveness of mediation for cross-border disputes, there are three elements that should be taken into consideration. One, the enforceability of the mediation clauses, that is the agreement to mediate. Some of these clauses may be incorporated in the original contract itself, perhaps preceding an arbitration clause. The second aspect is the enforceability of the mediated settlement agreements. So what, what is the status of a mediated settlement agreement? What happens if you reach the settlement through the mediation process? And finally, the success rate of the settlement procedure. How far is it, is it successful? Now, in most international commercial contracts, the parties include a dispute resolution clause, which in many cases is only an arbitration clause. Now, there is often a clause that requires the parties to try to resolve any dispute in good faith before they invoke the arbitration clause. Parties usually construe this to mean that there should be a negotiation preceding the arbitration. Now, invariably, such negotiation, being, uh, being an unregulated one, is never undertaken, or even if it is, it fails. Now, on the contrary, a mediation clause is increasingly being regulated, and in some countries, courts refuse to hear a claim if mediation was not attempted beforehand. Now, in countries such as Germany, England, Belgium, and France, the legislature or the courts have already provided that in cases where the mediation clause is sufficiently clear, the courts will not hear a claim if one of the parties has invoked the duty to mediate, and that duty has not been satisfied. Now, even though the European Directive is silent on the issue of the enforcement of mediation clauses, it appears that an uh, increasing number of states are already adopting some form of regulation in order for mediation clauses to be enforced. Now, this enforceability contributes greatly to the development success of mediation in cross-border disputes. Since the parties are now assured that they can benefit from trying to mediate the dispute before moving on to an adjudicated procedure. The second important element relating to the effectiveness of cross-border mediation is whether the mediated settlement agreement can be enforced by state courts. Now, it is in this context that the United Nations Convention on International Settlement Agreements resulting from mediation, which is otherwise called the Singapore Convention, has become the game changer. Now, before this, there were two different ways that courts could possibly enforce mediation agreements. First, by simply ratifying the settlement agreement and issuing a court order for its enforcement, or second, recording the settlement agreement in the form of an arbitral award. Even the Indian Arbitration and Conciliation Act of 1996 has something similar to that. Now, otherwise, the mediated settlement agreement would be nothing but an enforceable contract between the parties, setting out the parties, respective parties' obligations and writing. Now, what happens if there's any breach of terms of such contract? At best, it can lead to parties, again, going back to adversarial proceedings to enforce it. Now, the parties to an international commercial mediation will surely not want to take the chances in mediation if there is the risk that the other party then defaults in its obligations, forcing the non-defaulting party to bring a lawsuit for breach of contract. Now, the convention marks a key point in international mediation as it offers a new legal framework for cross-border disputes. The convention does not change the way that mediations are conducted, but rather makes the mediated settlement agreements enforceable in the courts of the member state. The courts of a contracting party will either enforce an international settlement agreement within the scope of the convention, or allow a party to invoke the settlement agreement in order to prove that the matter has already been resolved in accordance with the rules and, uh, of procedure under the conditions that are laid down in the convention. It could also be possible for the courts to refuse to grant relief on specified grounds laid down in the convention. Now, hopefully, this will give greater confidence to businesses to resolve international trade, trade disputes through mediation rather than through formal processes such as litigation or arbitration. Now, the third aspect that is important is the success rate. 
Now, studies have shown that in commercial mediation, particularly, uh, the probability of settlement is usually in excess of 80%. The success rate is not just in the US and UK, where medi mediation is fairly well established, but also in other European countries. A uh, majority of the companies who were surveyed, nearly 87% have also expressed satisfaction with the mediation process. Now, let me conclude by saying that the prospects look bright and express the hope that in India, too, we can see the early enactment of the Mediation Act uh, and the ratification of the Singapore Convention and also the establishment of a robust mediation ecosystem, both on the domestic as well as the international front. Thank you for the opportunity once again. I hope I have not exceeded my time. Apologies if I have. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir, for your valuable insights and highlighting the role of mediation in cross-border disputes. Now, I would like to request Dr. Anirudh Rajput to address the virtual gathering. Sir is a member of the UN International Law Commission. His areas of expertise are general international law, dispute resolution, boundary, uh, boundary disputes, law of the sea, international investment law, and international trade law. He has taught courses in international law at several universities and presently serves as the member of the Board of the Studies of South Asian University created by SARC countries. Sir, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I must begin by thanking you for the introduction and Professor Ahuja for this invitation. Uh, he's my, I must say, very warm academic friend who keeps my academic interests alive and strengthened. Uh, it's of course, a great honor to be a part on this panel being chaired by Justice uh, Bhanot. I've never had the opportunity of knowing him in person or even appearing before him, but it's, a, it's at least a pleasure to know him virtually. So I'm very pleased. And of course, I'm extremely delighted for the first time to meet in a virtual format uh, the new, uh, newly elected Secretary General of uh, ALCO, His Excellency Dr. Uh, Pinit uh, Puvado. Uh, I take this opportunity to congratulate him on his very worthy election, although I've written an email, but uh, a personal warm greeting is more important than an email and do hope to, to see him in person very soon. Of course, it's a pleasure to listen to, to Mr. Javed, Javed, who's an eminent practitioner in the field and has set out what really are the implications and why this is an important exercise. Although the time limit is of seven minutes, I'll try my best to stick to it and might go 30, 40 seconds here and there, and, and I, I hope that should not be too much of a problem. The focus that I wish to keep uh, of my presentation on is on investor state mediation. It is quite a specialized category of mediation, which is yet to take off really, and we doubt if it will take off because of uh, the complications involved. And I want to address some of those complications and how far these issues could be addressed. Now, the Singapore Convention is, of course, a very important and a helpful step on the part of the international community to recognize the importance of mediation. I've had the immense privilege of sending my personal comments to the law minister about what I think about uh, the, the, the bill which he wants to present in the parliament. I'm not sure if it is presented yet. But uh, one of my concerns has been it's very nice on the text, but we need to have the culture which uh, the US, EU, uh, and it's, I wouldn't be shocked to see a good rate in European Union because we traditionally think of the West as US and, and UK, but there is a much bigger world which is far more effective uh, within the EU structure and uh, which uh, there's a lot more to learn, although they follow different legal systems. But I don't want to get there. I really want to keep my focus simply on investor state arbitration. That is a situation where there is a dispute between a foreign investor and a state. That is a country, not a, like the state of Kerala or the state of Madhya Pradesh, but it means the Republic of India. By state, I mean in international law, a country as such. Now, the moment a country is involved, there are several complications that arise in a mediation process. Now let us understand what is happening at the international scenario. The International Set Center for Settlement of Investment Disputes has set out its own rules on mediation. The International Bar Association has set out its own rule of, uh, of uh, mediation in investor state arbitration. The ICC, International uh, Commercial Chamber of Commerce, has set out its own rules. LCI has also proposed some rules, although not geared specifically towards uh, investment arbitration, I stand for the correction. 
we do see a lot of these institutional rules being made. We also have the example of uh, the EU Vietnam bilateral investment treaty, which has a reference to mediation. In fact, the most comprehensive discussion on what the procedure should be, what the code of conduct should be in mediation can be found in CETA, uh, the Canada EU free trade agreement, which is considered to be the most latest and the most advanced form of, uh, of uh, free trade agreements that we have, the most latest generation investment treaties, the uh, Canada uh, EU free trade agreement. The Canada EU free trade agreement has extensive references. In fact, it sets out the procedure. It even has a code of conduct for mediators. But there it tries to simply borrow from what is happening within the domestic legal system. And that's a bit of a problem because uh, the concerns in a domestic legal system don't essentially function well when it comes to public international law and essentially in the context of investment arbitration. So there is an investor on one side and there is a, there is a host state on the other. Uh, China in its model bilateral investment treaty has a provision to that effect. I was a part of the Law Commission of India which revised the Indian model BIT and to be honest I don't remember if we had a provision in mediation because at that stage this, was a, this hadn't picked up but my impression is probably we don't. Now assuming that mediation is going to pick up or is expected to pick up, do we have the environment conducive in investment arbitration to allow mediation? Mediation fun fundamentally is based on confidence between the parties. The commercial parties both have to have confidence with each other that they can sit together and resolve this, of course, with the help of a third party. Because as we know, the Singapore Convention quite aptly defines mediation as a facilitated dispute resolution with the involvement of the third party, where the third party really functions as a catalyst. Because if the third party starts acting anything further, anything beyond than simply facilitating the process, then there is a possibility that it might become conciliation proceedings. And I find it a little bit strange because in investment arbitration, there is a big push for mediation, but, uh, but uh, conciliation has absolutely failed. It's, it has had conciliation rule, nobody has used that. Interestingly, under the UNCLOS, the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, if a state has made an exception to its dispute resolution clause, then there is something called compulsory conciliation, which is quite a novel concept. And we have the first example of a successful conciliation between, between Timor-Leste and Australia, where the maritime dispute between Timor-Leste and Australia was resolved by the conciliator. And I had the opportunity of speaking to some of those who were involved in the proceeding as counsel. And what we do see that there is a much active involvement on the part of a conciliator than in mediation. In fact, uh, Professor Thomas Vail wrote a very interesting article about his experience of uh, resolving uh, a dispute between two corporations, uh, a very large energy dispute. I don't remember the name of the article, but if you Google it, I'm sure it will throw up some suggestions. And what we do see is confidence is critical for commercial entities to speak to each other. It's not just the confidence with each other, between each other, but it is also the confidence with the media, who is going to have a critical role in ensuring that he's a catalyst to find a resolution. Now let us use these elements and apply them in investment arbitration and see what happens. In investment arbitration, it is often an investor on one side who is suing a state. So there's already a certain degree of discomfort on the part of a state that there's a private investor who is suing a whole sovereign state. And a state is expected to compensate the investor from its taxes, from its sovereign wealth which it has collected from its factories. In fact, there have been some examples where the compensation was so high, I forget the name of the state, but there was a Latin American state. The compensation was equal to the health budget for one year of that state. So would a state be willing to get into mediation of, of such kind? There are doubts. In fact, I was speaking on this very topic at the last uh, in-person uh, ALCO conference, uh, which happened in Dar es Salaam, where uh, by when the COVID hadn't, there was no outbreak and we were still in happier times. And one of the government uh, lawyers, uh, I won't name, but of course one of the ALCO government lawyers came up to me and said, well, but what about confidentiality and how much to be disclosed? Because uh, a state may not want to put all its cards on the table. And so also the foreign investor would not want to put on all its cards on the table. For mediation to be successful, it is critical that the both the parties are willing to put their cards on the table to discuss, discuss at least with the mediator how he wants to proceed. 
if the states are afraid, if the investor is afraid that it might affect my legal arguments, of course the position of the law is it would not, but there's always a fear that my position might be compromised, then there is a problem. What is being sold as the greatest uh, attractive feature of mediation, that is uh, confidentiality, is one of the greatest obstacles when it comes to investment arbitration, because often these investment arbitration involve matters of environment, labor standards. In fact, one of the recent most controversial award of, of uh, Eco Oro versus Columbia involved uh, a very large forest and that forest was uh, was covered by the by the Convention on Biological Diversity. The Constitution of Colombia protected it. Yet the majority found that the measures taken by the state were contrary. And of course, uh, the dissenting arbitrator wrote a very interesting and a very strong dissent. In this context, where there are issues of public interest involved, can a mediator simply say, "Well, arrive at a compromise, and this is a good compromise." In fact, now there's a practice of of having uh, amici brief, amicus curiae presentations made by non-parties and often these are taken into account by investment tribunals. There are several instances of this. So what is going to happen to that? How is that factor going to be adjusted into all this? So it's quite doubtful looking at the various segments of investment arbitration or various pieces of the machine pulling in different direction, directions. It's really doubtful if it, can, if it can create that optimum environment for mediation to proceed further. But if at all mediation ought to proceed, it ought to proceed or based on the credibility of the mediator. These are highly contentious political disputes. Often investors have lost their investments. They are really interested in getting a compensation. That might be a factor to attract them for going forward for mediation, but that might also be a factor to distract them from going for mediation because they may want to extract as much compensation as they can from an actual investment arbitration proceeding rather than going for mediation. Assuming they do decide to go for mediation, uh, what are the factors on which they are going to agree to it? And there are several factors on states, there are several ministries involved. Are all ministries going to sign off uh, such a settlement? So there's, there's an issue of that. And speaking lastly on the credibility of the arbitrators, because I've already exceeded my time and towards the end of it. So it's mediator in investment arbitration ought to be someone who's politically suave. He needs to understand the political implications of these disputes. What are the going to be the implications for the state and what are going to be the implications for the investor? It is only if these factors are taken into account the possibility of creating a balance. I'm not saying that, uh, that it would not succeed at all. But it may not be as successful as one might assume it to be, or at least what ICSID thinks it, it or, or some, of the, some of the other international institutions think it is going to be. And some of these principles, not exactly in the same context, are also relevant for domestic law, the domestic context. So there's going to be a real challenge about how the law is implemented and how well we have created the environment for mediation to foster. And I'm very confident with, that with the contribution of the eminent judges we have, so one, we have chairing our panel, Justice Banot, but I'm sure there are many others who have participated throughout this conference. Their incentives and their carrot and stick policy of forcing at times to parties within their limits could also potentially pave way for successful mediation in India, especially for for cross borders. And thanks for inviting me. Thank you so much, sir, for your valuable opinions and discussing the obstacles to mediation and investment disputes. Now, I would like to make a humble request to His Excellence, Dr. Kamaline Pinit Puvadol to address the virtual gathering. Sir started his career as a lecturer and researched in the areas of private international law, international investment law, international trade law, international economic law, international law on children's rights, and European Union law. He is currently serving as the Secretary General at Asian African Legal Consultative Organization, New Delhi. Sir, the virtual stage is yours. So thank you very much. Uh, this is my uh, great pleasure and honor to be uh, part of this uh, important panel on issue of uh, uh, cross-border uh, settlement. And, and I'm so happy to be here and, and I'd like to, to salute uh, the Honorable Mr. Justice Ajay Bano, Excellency Dr. Anirudh Rajput, and uh, Professor V.K. Oja, including also Essence Jawad. 
And let me allow me to, to highlight a little bit about the, the outgoing, which I'm the second general, as uh, may, may some of you may know about Algo. Uh, Algo in the past, we have uh, uh, worked on issue of uh, uh, peaceful settlements. It's also related to the issue of uh, mediation. And, and as you may know that uh, Algo is the outcome of the Bandung Conference uh, in 1955. And one year later, Algo is set up. And the objective of Algo is mainly uh, on the uh, progressive developments and codification of international law. This is our main task. And also, I'll go try to, to, to uh, uh, give the perspective of uh, uh, Asian African countries. Now we have uh, 47 member states to a particular issue of uh, international law. And I'll go work closely with the ILC, International Law Commission, and, and we provide uh, the output from, from the countries uh, in the regions. Uh, as uh, the issue of uh, the cross-border disputes and, and international mediation is uh, under our work programs, uh, the Pacific settlement of disputes uh, is one of the agenda of our goal. And in the past, our goal secretary has uh, urging member states to adopt mediation process in their respective uh, agreements, such as uh, FTA free trade agreements or bilateral investment treaties, and also in uh, investment contract. Uh, in order to benefit from the pro process and promote uh, the cost effective settlement of investment disputes. And also uh, regarding the Pacific settlement of disputes, uh, which is uh, under our work programs, and ALCO also focus on the establishment of uh, institution dealing with the dispute settlement. Uh, as you may know, uh, uh, the mechanism to uh, provide the service for dispute settlements is uh, the center which deal with the uh, uh, dispute settlements. And, and now ALCO have uh, uh, mainly a uh, uh, six regional arbitration center uh, since uh, 1973, uh, during the annual session, this is the idea that uh, I'll go uh, follow up the work of Ancetral in the field of uh, international commercial arbitration. And uh, we conclude to uh, setting up the arbitration, the center, regional center of arbitration. So until now, Alco has established uh, six uh, regional arbitration center. Uh, may I? site at follow. We have the Asian International Arbitration Center in, in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, the Cairo Arbitration Center for International Commercial Arbitration uh, in Arab Republic, Egypt, Regional Center for International Commercial Arbitration in Lagos, uh, Nigeria, and Tehran Regional Center for Commercial Arbitration, Nairobi Center for International Arbitration in Republic of Kenya. And recently, during the last annual session last year, the 59 annual session, the establishment of ALCO Hong Kong Regional Arbitration Center was uh, officially announced during the annual session. So now we have uh, uh, six uh, regional center on arbitration. And under the auspice of uh, the ALCO, all regional arbitration function as an uh, uh, international institution with the objective of promoting international commercial dispute settlement in Asian African countries and <coughs> providing for the conducting of uh, international arbitration and, and mediation. And also the six, uh, existing regional arbitration uh, center seek to integrate in the ALCO dispute settlement system and perform a variety of tasks, including providing facility for ADR or alternative dispute set resolution services, such as mediation for international commercial and investment dispute settlement. And in this regard, uh, let's take an example of the Cairo Center, which offers specialized service to settle trade and investment dispute through reputation and also mediation. It includes also ADR, such as uh, conciliation mediation. And apart from this, the center also offer advice to party to international commercial and investment contract. 
with regard to drafting this contract and promote application and alter ADR, alternative dispute resolution technique in the Afro-Asian regions to the organization of an international conference seminar organized uh, training programs or galaxy building because it's very important to, 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 to provide some knowledge and exchange the idea on the issue of uh, ADR, including the mediation. And also the regional center uh, in, in KL, Kuala Lumpur, uh, Malaysia, offer facility and assistance to conduct the arbitral proceeding, including the enforcement of award. And also uh, the center issued the uh, mediation rules for the center. And as the, the mediation uh, process is flexible, uh, now all the, the regional center on arbitration adopt uh, the, the, the rule of mediation for themselves. And also uh, the scope of uh, mediation in, in every uh, regional center focus on administering uh, domestic and international mediation, including ADR, and providing ad hoc mediation and other ADR mechanism, uh, providing advice, uh, promotion of mediation and other ADR mechanism in the regions. Uh, building capacity is very important uh, for mediators, legal scholars from Afro-Asian regions by organizing training programs, workshop on mediation and coordination with uh, and provision of assistance to other mediation and ADR institution, uh, particularly those existing with, within the regions. And also uh, establishing a comprehensive library, library specializing in mediation and ADR. This is very important and at the task of uh, the uh, regional center uh, established under the auspice of, of ALGO in each regions of uh, Asia and Africa. And, and uh, I'd like also to highlight some of these developments uh, uh, in the legal framework of cross-border disputes and international mediation. Uh, for example, two uh, recent developments uh, uh, solicit mention. Uh, the first one as uh, Excellency Dr. Anirudh and uh, uh, Excellency Jawad just uh, raised the issue of the Singapore Convention on Mediation. This is very important. And, and so many member states of ALCO joined this convention by signing some uh, ratified this convention. And this is uh, the, the first and very important uh, convention on mediation. And another development uh, in terms of the uh, legal framework of uh, international mediations is, is about, uh, as uh, Excellency Dr. Anirudh Rajput raised the issue of ISDS, investor state dispute settlement. This issue is uh, very important today. As you may know that uh, now uh, we have uh, more than 1,200 ISDS cases. Uh, for example, if we look at the, the website of ANTAT, the investment policy hub, the number increased uh, year by year. And, and the issue of ACS is uh, now is very uh, di disputable in many academic institutions, even in the conference of uh, uh, the UN agencies such as ANTAT, uh, ANSITRAL, even OECD also. And, and uh, the, the ongoing discussion on the reform of ACS, as you may know that uh, the ANSITRAL is mandated by the UN to, to uh, undertake the reform of the ISDS through the Working Group 3. And, and the, the, the reform of ISDS uh, within UNCTRAL uh, show that there is an appetite from both investor and state for preventing of disputes among them. And several states submission underlie the importance of measure to prevent disputes from arising and address mean to resolve this through method of mediation, mediation uh, alternative to court or arbitration. And this is uh, the, the recent developments of uh, the issue of ACS, uh, just uh, uh, discussing under the auspice of the, the working group of ANSI trial. And also the recent reform, as uh, many of you may know that now, Many countries is, uh, are in the process of uh, uh, reform of uh, 
their investment treaties. Uh, now we have uh, more than bilateral investment treaties, uh, more than 2,500 bilateral investment treaty conclude uh, today. And every country uh, need to reform the existing bilateral investment treaties. And, and uh, the recent reform of treaties signed by many states, uh, either in form of uh, a chapter of investment in the FTA, free trade agreements, or in the bilateral investment treaties, show that mediation conciliation is slowly getting attention and traction in treaty language. This is very important. And, and under the UNTAD report uh, uh, 2019, identify a number of treaties signed in 2018, which do exactly that. And a review of this provision show that the most advanced text is probably the agreements between EU and Vietnam, which include uh, the integral annex dealing with mediation for the ISDS. So uh, I'd like to highlight these uh, issues. And, and once again, I thank uh, warmly the organizer for uh, this invitation to this very important events and hope that uh, what I deliver will be fruitful for this uh, discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir, for a valuable insight and further advancing our discussions by highlighting the role of ALCO in international dispute settlements. Now, I would like to make a humble request to Honorable Mr. Justice Ajay Bhenu to address the virtual gathering. Sir has practiced civil, constitutional, tax, service, company law, and criminal side at Allahabad High Court and also handled matters relating to environmental, industrial disputes, and other allied branches of law. Lordship, the floor is yours. Excellency Dr. Anirudh Rajput, Excellency Dr. Cameron Pinnett Pukdol, Professor B.K. Ahuja, Professor Dr. Ashutosh Mishra, Shri Jabba. I hope I've got your name uh, correct, sir. Yes, sir. I, uh, I have the good fortune of being preceded by such a, an eminent and a distinguished panel that I have no hesitation in saying that whatever was needed to be covered as far as international commercial disputes, cross-border disputes are concerned, pretty much gets covered, leaving me <clears throat> with a job which I like quite often while sitting on the bench. When, ha one, when one has very illustrious partners on the bench, that the judge simply writes, I agree. That, pretty, uh, that covers not only the topic, but also prevents confusion or discordant decisions. But as I have seen this topic, cross-border dispute and international mediation, and from my own experience at the domestic level of mediation, the word cross-border has to be seen in a, if I may say, a larger context and will have to embrace other aspects of mediation, which may go to the realm of international law, like environmental issues could be mediated. Conflict resolution issues could also be mediated. Refugee problems. And why is this issue of mediation coming up and assuming such importance? We need, to, we need to look back at the evolution of international law through international instruments and how it has been implemented in various domestic laws and change the course of human history. After the Second World War, the world was shaken with an unspeakable tragedy, but also guided by the unquenchable optimism of the human race. And we saw the emergence of the human, of the UN Charter, which amongst other things said, to save the succeeding generations from the scourge of war. That was the first, in, among the first subject to correction, 
institutions, uh, instrument, national, international instruments, which referenced mediation as a form of dialogue and conflict resolution. The international law and international law instruments, which have uh, often been experienced in our day-to-day -day working in our domestic, in our national courts as well. I would like to pick up two instruments and the whole, uh, the following chain of events. One was the instruments which relate to empowerment of women and child rights jurisprudence. Initially enacted by the United Nations, initially these instruments were ratified by various secretaries. Subsequently, all these international instruments started to get uh, reflection in the domestic laws of the country. And finally, all these are now being implemented by various courts of the countries. So it is these values like child rights, uh, jurisprudence, empowerment of women, the need for a dialogue, un unicetral model, as, as we have seen, we have an arbitration uh, act and a mediation, uh, arbitration and conciliation act consistent with that. What is happening, this trend as one would see it, is the emergence of a sovereignty of values that is these internationally accepted or those values on which the community of nations has a consensus become sovereign in themselves that no matter what the government, no matter what the, uh, the ideology of the state, the values will be implemented and become a day-to-day -day reality in the functioning of the state and the lives of the people. When we speak of mediation, the biggest challenge is to make is to put mediation at that level of a sovereign value. Evolution of the concept of consensual values does not dilute, does not lead to a dilution of sovereignty of the nation state, but it only affirms the sovereignty of values. Why do we need mediation today? I think we, we would look at the paradox of the technological revolution. We have the benefit of technology. All of us are sitting at our respective places and yet being able to communicate. But yet, with a plethora of devices, we also see a paucity of dialogue. We are chatting more and understanding less. With all these international organizations, we are also seeing that interests often threaten principles. The search for security of one party ends up creating an insecurity for other parties. All this needs a dialogue, a framework, and a mod medium of dialogue. Me mediation offers that method. One of the methods in which a dialogue of humanity can happen on all issues, including commercial disputes. Mediation is less adversarial as all of, as are my esteemed prece uh, pre uh, preceding speakers were, are saying. It is a flexible approach. And the most important thing is the parties retain their agency. That is a critical aspect. But when we come to international mediation on international issues, be it trade, it can also be an environmental litigation, say water, Environment does not recognize our man-made borders. If we have, say, an, uh, an environmental issue which is coming up, it can be resolved through international mediation. So, but the complexities of international mediation, of course, have also been partly captured, uh, or rather very deftly captured by the preceding speakers. In fact, there is also an article by Dr. Ahuja who talks about cultural gaps or cultural issues, be it cultural issues or be it a historical baggage. These are all aspects which come into the way of countries accepting mediation, societies accepting mediation as a viable and a legitimate method of dispute resolution. You have issues of <clears throat> mediator bias, now, if we see some of the international disputes which were resolved through mediation, Camp David comes to mind where Israel and Egypt signed a peace accord. You had the Norwegian 
mediators intervening in the Israel-Palestine issue. But on the other side, we also find at times you have an arms supplier to a conflict who's coming in as a mediator. I don't know what will happen in that fact situation, but the credibility of, the medi of mediation as a process will definitely take a beating. So what we need today is to create acceptability for mediation in various facets of our life, which are all entangled. We live as a global village today. We have to entrench the indispensability of mediation. There is no substitute for dialogue, war and litigation. War in between nations and litigations between in, uh, investors and states are often seen as not as viable options or alternatives. And that is where mediation comes in. Communication. Now, invariably, mediation helps to reignite the dialogue between parties. You need good communicators. I have reverence for all seers of the world, but I would just, after paying my uh, homage to all, I would just remem uh, remember Gautam Buddha. He did not have the benefit of WhatsApp, and yet the whole world is bowing before his eternal wisdom. Communicators, a mediator has to be a communicator. We have to invest this process with legitimacy and organization. In my experience as a judge, what I found was that international instruments become a very important source of legitimacy. Once in international instruments, countries become signatories to international instruments, they enact laws. And once those laws are enacted in domestic jurisdictions, they are implemented and executed through the state agencies and the courts. That is a formidable act of creating legitimacy. And once that legitimacy is created, a whole structure, a detailed process, and as the pre uh, preceding speakers were uh, dis uh, discussing, enforcement of the agreements, a plan has to be laid out in that uh, international instrument. A pool of mediators and their training, as uh, His Excellency Cameline was saying, the training of the mediators, it becomes very critical because that is what builds the capacity of the society, the state, and the international community, training of the mediators, to create a pool of mediators because, as I said, bias interest. Now you have that, we are all aware, I don't want to repeat that, but that situation where one party is supplying arms to a belligerent in a conflict and also acting as a mediator. So we need to go beyond that. The international instruments reflect the ideals, the structure of the regime reflects the will of the international community. I began by drawing from the most modern charter comprising values and endeavors of the human race in the modern world. I would like to conclude by invoking the most ancient scripture, manifesting the ideals and the stirrings of humankind. When our sages of yore said, Loka Samasta Sukhinu Bhavantu. Let all of humanity experience happiness and contentment because Sukhinu does Sukh does not have an exact translation in happiness. So it is contentment and happiness. So with this, mediation would probably be showing the way to achieve that age-old striving of the human race. With this, I would like to conclude and thank, my, thank the organizers and my preceding speakers and ladies and gentlemen for a very patient hearing. Thank you, Lordship, for sharing your valuable insights. Thank you for highlighting the need of mediation in this ever-changing world and the various facets of our life. I would like to respectfully borrow a line from your speech, a mediator needs to be a communicator. Now I would like to request Professor Dr. V.K. Hoja to share the concluding remarks and to pose a vote of thanks. 
Thank you, Dhananjay. Thank you, Dhananjay. Uh, it was a wonderful session, and uh, all the speakers, you know, they have given uh, various aspects of uh, mediation. I was just listening to them very carefully, and uh, there were some uh, very good uh, remarks coming from them. Starting with uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Javed, uh, he had rightly pointed out that uh, commercial disputes have taken a new dimension now, and then he quoted a paper. Uh, where, uh, you know, in the paper, uh, some uh, reasons were cited like the cost delay, technicality, lack of qualification of national judges. Uh, then he also uh, pointed out the problems in arbitration also. Now, that was something, you know, I was uh, uh, examining a thesis uh, on arbitration, and that thesis was written by a very senior uh, official of, uh, of PSU, uh, Maharatna Company. And, uh, you know, that PSC used to be uh, going for arbitration. And he pointed out how this arbitration has become very expensive, very time consuming, because, you know, the arbitral awards were being given, they were being challenged. And when, once the judgment comes, review petition was also being filed. So ultimately, it was taking a lot of time. And if you see the arbitration fee, uh, it was going uh, very, very high nowadays. So therefore, uh, you know, the, uh, he uh, focused on conciliation because uh, mediation bill was not introduced uh, till then. And uh, of course, arbitration, which used to be considered as uh, one of the uh, preferred choice is uh, now losing its charm. Mr. Javed has also pointed out the ODR resolution, which of course is extremely important. And uh, I would definitely like to listen to him exclusively on ODR uh, resolution. Uh, which of course uh, is going to stay uh, because uh, in ODR, you need not uh, travel to the seat of uh, uh, mediation. And then about uh, uh, satisfaction uh, result, he talked about 87% uh, of the companies uh, had shown uh, satisfaction towards mediation. And this is uh, something which is very increasing and very promising. So one can, uh, you know, uh, very well argue that mediation uh, is going to have a good future. Coming to His Excellency Dr. Anir Anirudh Rajput, uh, he talked about the mediation bill. He talked about his comments, which were uh, sent to the Honorable Law Minister, where he said that uh, the text is nice, but then the culture should also be nice. And then he talked about mediation in the investment agreement. And he raised a question which is very pertinent. Do we have the environment conducive for uh, mediation? Dr. Rajput has uh, pointed out uh, one issue which uh, in the morning also I have also raised when uh, we were talking about mediation in IPR disputes. And that was about credibility of mediator. Now, if you see the commercial disputes uh, Act 2015, which was amended uh, in 2018. And thereafter, in 2018, the uh, rules were also framed. If you look at section 12 of those rules, it talks about ethics for mediators. So where, you know, it's a long provision where some ethics have been prescribed for mediator. Now, this is uh, something which is extremely important because we are, we are venturing into a new uh, you know, mode of uh, resolving disputes. And we should not forget that if the credibility of the system has not been uh, established, then it may also fail you know, like any other system. If, if the mediators uh, 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 are doubted for their integrity, then obviously uh, this will be a big blow uh, to the institution of mediation itself. So that is something where we have to look more into the credibility of the mediator. And of course, we have to train uh, uh, mediators, you know, as to what is to be done, what is not to be done, and how he has uh, uh, proved himself to be impartial to both the parties. Uh, Dr. Anirudh Rajput has uh, also shown a flip side of mediation in the investment matters uh, with respect to confidentiality. Now, that is uh, something, you know, which of course is completely new to me. And of course, if uh, it is based on some uh, experiences, you know, then it is really a matter of concern and one need to think about it, particularly in the investment matters. 
Moving on to His Excellency Kamalin, uh, uh, the presentation was really wonderful where uh, uh, His Excellency has pointed out the role played by ALCO in the Pacific Settlement of Disputes. He talked about the six regional centers of uh, arbitration which are doing very well. There is one point which he has very rightly pointed out and that was the building capacity of uh, 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 mediators of the people, you know, as mediators in Asian and African countries. And for that particular purpose, ALCO is organizing a lot of uh, programs on mediation. Now, that is something which is uh, uh, extremely important and which is very much required. And uh, uh, Excellency has also pointed out uh, uh, about the members of the ALCO who had joined uh, Singapore Convention. And of course, uh, many more will be joining soon. So finally, uh, Lordship uh, Mr. Justice uh, Ajay Behanod had talked about uh, uh, mediation in uh, international law. In fact, to be very honest, I have uh, never come across a judge who spoke so well on the matter of public international law. Uh, normally, I have seen judges, you know, uh, they are very good in uh, national law, but uh, I could see Justice Ajay Behanod who spoke very well on various aspects of public international law and how the mediation can uh, help. Uh, particularly, uh, he talked about environmental uh, cases, he talked about refusing matters also, where mediation can uh, play a role. And then one example which he, uh, he has given that suppose if a country is mediating and that at the same time, it is also providing, you know, arms and ammunition to one of the parties. Now, obviously, you know, uh, we are, we are denting the very credibility of that particular system, uh, which should not be there. And uh, 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 Lordship, uh, you have very well uh, given the example of uh, uh, Buddha, where you said that, well, there was no WhatsApp at that point of time, but he happened to be uh, one of the best communicators and uh, the entire world was, uh, you know, uh, benefited by his external wisdom. With these uh, words, uh, uh, on behalf of uh, Faculty of Law, University of Delhi, uh, Delhi School of Public Policy and Governance, which is an institution of eminence, and uh, MCPC, Mediation and Conciliation Project Committee of the Supreme Court of India. I thank uh, Honorable Lordship, Mr. Justice uh, Ajay Bhanod for chairing the session. I also thank uh, His Excellency, Dr. Kamalin Pinit Puwadol uh, for co-chairing co the session. I'm also thankful to His Excellency, Professor Kennedy Gaston, uh, the former Secretary General of ALCO, and who is presently ambassador of Tanzania to United Nations for connecting me to His Excellency, Dr. Kamalin. Professor uh, Kennedy uh, could not join us as uh, he's traveling and there is issue of the time zone also because he is uh, presently in the United Nations. I'm also thankful to my friend and guest of honor, His Excellency, Dr. Anirudh Rajput for being with us for the conference. And uh, His Excellency has always uh, supported uh, all, uh, uh, you know, his help to our academic ventures whenever we approached him. My thanks are also due to our special guest, Sherry A.G. Jawad, who has al always been kind to us and uh, who had always graced the occasions whenever we have invited him. Thank you, sir, for being with us. I'm also thankful to the Dean Faculty of Law, Professor Usha Tandar, and uh, my colleague, uh, my brother, Dr. Ashutosh Mishra and the entire of his team, uh, which are working day and night to make this conference success. Finally, I am also thankful to uh, MCPC Supreme Court and its officials for uh, giving us an opportunity to collaborate with uh, them and uh, to organize this particular conference. Thank you very much. Namaskar. Thank you, sir, for your kind words. The insights shared by the panelists have truly been thought provoking and informative. I thank all of the people who have made this session a huge success. With this, the session comes to an end and I request all the participants to fill the feedback form available in the chat box. Kindly note that filling the feedback form is mandatory requirement for certificates. Thank you and I wish everyone a great day ahead.